Hello, hello, how we doing? All right, hey, I gotta give a quick shout out to my boy Rhett before I get started tonight. Rhett, thank you so much for sharing. Yes, um, I, uh, I'll, I'll tell a little bit more about it this in a second, but I got to spend the weekend with him, so I got to see uh, God move, not only in him, but the entire ninth grade guys small group. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Larry, and I am on staff here. I'm our student relations coordinator which basically means my entire job is, to get it, is getting to build relationships with you all so that I can see and we can see you develop and build relationships with Jesus. And I have been on staff here for about three years now. Um, and I gotta be honest with y'all, this past weekend at Unplugged might have been one of my favorite weekends since I've been here on staff. How many people were at Unplugged this past weekend? How many people had a good time at Unplugged? Okay, good. Uh, I was hoping I wasn't the only one, and it was one of my favorite weekends that we've done here, not because of the, the lights or the games or uh, the food, which the food was awesome though, um, but it was one of my favorite weekends, and if you came to the last Unplugged, uh, the, the first Unplugged, I guess, it, it's just so beautiful to see 200 or so people gathered together distraction-free. And I think that we uh, live in a world where there are distractions on distractions, uh, specifically Ben holding up his croc like it's a cell phone right now. And that's not to call y'all Ben, that was really funny actually, I guess you. Um, but what I wanna do before we get going tonight is I want to do my best and I want us to do our best to remove whatever distractions we have right now. And so, much like we did it unplugged, I want to ask if you are not taking notes on your phone, turn it off. Just turn it off right now. I'm gonna turn mine off because I don't need it. I also don't know how to turn, Rhett, can you hold my phone? Okay, I don't know how to turn it off. I thought I did, that's really awkward. But just like, don't let that be a distraction either. Sweet, so I want us to just remove whatever distractions we have on us because I think when we begin to remove distractions, it just helps us hear what God has to say to us much more clearly. Uh, I think our phones are a great tool, but I think they are also a great distraction. And any of you who are at Unplugged got to see how much easier it is to focus on the things of God when we don't have that little square in our pocket. And so, just like I said, if you're not taking notes uh, on that, uh, first of all, bring a notebook next week. Bring that. I would encourage you to start taking handwritten notes. Uh, but if you can tonight, just turn it off uh, and we can remove distractions right away. And I see... Uh, I saw this past weekend God do uh, an incredible work in a lot of people's lives. And I, I think that my prayer coming out of this weekend, I know our staff's prayer, is that this past weekend would not just be an isolated event, but it would be something that is a catalyst moving forward. We saw that it was last year, and that is our prayer again this year. And uh, we intentionally planned this series to come after Unplugged. Because much like we had anticipated, much like we prayed for, we saw salvation come. And we wanna have a series over the next month where we talk about what it looks like to walk out of salvation, work out your salvation in the world. And I wanna make something very clear on the outset here. We're gonna talk a lot over the next uh, month about what it looks like to walk as a believer. We're gonna talk a lot about actions and things that we do, but if you are in this space tonight and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I wanna make this very clear. Nothing that I say over the next month, no behavior modification, no, no practice, no spiritual discipline is gonna save you. And so if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, we have to understand that that comes first. And I want you guys to know that the reason I have such a, a soft spot and a sweet spot for high schoolers is because it was in high school that I gave my life to Jesus. How many of you are in 10th or 11th grade? Raise your hand. All right, so it was the summer after my 10th grade year, I was going into my junior year of high school when I first responded to the call that God had on my life. I received the Holy Spirit and I began to learn in that moment, that summer, what it meant to walk as a believer. And I remember after giving my life to Jesus, I, I started to hear messages and I started to have conversations with small group leaders and they started to talk about how now you are a believer and so this is what it looks like to walk as a believer. And I, I remember... Like, I didn't know a lot of those things beforehand. I didn't know what, what instructions I was given, what, what responsibilities and tasks I was supposed to be doing as a believer. And so we're gonna talk about this word ethics. And you saw in that video that, that ethics are simply the principles that govern the way that we live. 
Ethics are simply the principles that govern the way we live. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look this series about the ethics as believers. What are, what are Christian ethics? What are things that as believers we should be doing? And we're going to talk about how as we submit to the word of God, what that looks like practically in the life of a believer. And like I said earlier, none of the things that we're gonna talk about over the next month are gonna save you. So simply just changing the way that you live is not going to save you. And so I just wanna make that clear as we begin talking. We're gonna, I'm gonna be talking a lot to believers, but I want you to recognize that if you're not a believer in the room tonight, it is a constant invitation into a better way of living. This is a better way of living and we're gonna see how that plays itself out and so what I want to do really quick is just recap kind of what we talked about at Unplugged. We talked a lot about this word grace, and we looked at Romans chapter 5 and 6. And so in Romans chapter 5, we see the work that Christ has done for us. We see how he is a gift that is given to us, how it's a better way, how he died on the cross, rose from the grave, what he did. And then we see in Romans chapter 6 what that enables us to do as believers. What does Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection do for us? What does it enable for us as believers? And I think it's summed up really well in Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Paul says this, he says, So you, you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Which begs the question, what does that mean? What does it look like to be dead to sin and alive to God? What does it look like to be dead to sin and alive to God? Because that's what we're, we're enabled to do. Because of what Jesus has done, we can be dead to sin. And so in the end of Romans chapter six, Paul lists at least five ways that we, that, or what it should look like to be dead to sin. He, he answers that question at least five times. He says in chapter six, verse 16, he says, don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that which you obey, either of sin leading to death or obedience living, leading to righteousness. So he talks about being obedient slaves, obedience leading to righteousness. And then in verse 18, he says, and having been set free from sin, again, the work that Jesus has done enables us to what? Be enslaved to righteousness. In verse 19, he says, I am using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater law lawlessness, that's a tongue twister. So now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. So again, he's talking about being slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. That's what we are enabled to do. And then finally in verse 22, he says, but now since you have been set free from sin and you have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification and the outcome is eternal life. In a matter of six verses, I only listed four verses right here. In a matter of the last six verses in chapter six though, he, he says there are, there are a couple of common themes when it comes to the life of a believer. What should that look like? And the two common themes that we see just in the end of chapter six are obedience and slavery. Obedience and slavery. And he uses th these intense words because what he is teaching us is that when we follow Jesus, when we as believers make the decision to respond to God's call on our life and submit our lives to Jesus, we are submitting to a new way of living, to a new set of principles that we govern our life by. We are submitting to a new way of living and a new way of thinking. And this is Christian ethics. And over the next month, this is what it is, is obedience to God. And so as we talk about all of these things, this is what we as believers should strive for is obedience. It's the thing that God has asked for since he created Adam and Eve. It's the thing he asked for all in the Old Testament. And it's the thing he asked of his believers and his followers now is that we would be obedient to the things that he has set out for us and given us in his word. And so... We're going to talk about uh, in Romans chapter 12. We've seen now Romans chapter 5 is what Christ has done for us. Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 are all what it enables us to do. And now we get to Romans chapter 12. I know I skipped a couple of numbers. I can count, I promise. In Romans chapter 12, we're going to start to see my favorite thing in the Bible. It's the practical things. Because I think we, we sometimes can get overwhelmed with, hey, don't be, de be dead to sin, live in righteousness, live in righteousness. But I always want to ask the question, and I, I imagine there are some of you in here too, where what does that look like though? What does it look like? Because I think that those concepts are great and I love that, but how do I do it though? And if we don't understand the simple and the practical, 
then we get lost in it. And Paul knows that, the Holy Spirit knows that, and so he gives us Romans chapter 12. And so we see in the very beginning of chapter 12, these are two of Tucker and I's favorite verses because they are so important in the life of a believer. Paul says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God. And I wanna stop right here for just a quick second because I think that we can gloss over that and and get to the practical, right? But in view of the mercies of God, Jesus dying on the cross and saving us from our sins is an act of mercy by God. And so as we set our eyes on that, as we think about that, that should cause something to be different in our lives and in our thinking. And so he says, in view of the mercies of God, think about the things that Jesus has done for you, the things that God has done for you. And in light of those things, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And so he starts with this first instruction to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And so he says, your way of living, your choices, the decisions that you make, if you are a believer, those things are no longer your own, but they are now sacrifices that you give to God. Every choice that you make, every decision that you, you act upon is a, an act of sacrifice to God. And so then he says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of what? Your mind. And so God, right off the bat, is saying, hey, these are the two things that when you become a believer are transformed. From selfish things that you used to use to glorify yourself, now your living and your thinking are used to glorify me. They are used to honor and worship me. And so, because of what we have learned in Romans 5 and 6, because of the mercy of God, we now are transformed. And now we get to the practical. What does that look like? It looks like love. The practical living of a Christian should look like love. And Christian ethics always leads us to love. Any set of rules and instructions that we follow as a believer is not to to get us to a legalistic way of thinking, but it's to get us to love. And we're going to talk about three different things that it causes us to love. The first being God, the second being the church. We're going to talk about that next week, and then we're going to finish up later on with talking about how it leads us to love people. And so tonight we're going to spend time talking about how as we submit our thinking and our living to God, how that communicates our love for him. And so Romans chapters, chapter 12 verses 9 and 11 are the two verses that we're going to be talking about. Chapter, or verse 10 talks about loving people and or the church. And so we'll talk about that next week and the week after. But I want us to focus on these two verses. And I want us to focus on the five ways in these two verses that we can love God. As we, we cultivate these dis, dis, uh, disciplines in our life, as we cultivate these things, how it offers our bodies and our minds as living sacrifices. And so the first of the five, we love God by loving genuinely. We love God by loving genuinely. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Paul starts this section by saying, love must be, or love, let love be without hypocrisy, which is to say this, your love for God needs to be the same on the inside as it is on the outside. Do you guys want to know what's really easy as a believer? Like the easiest part of being just a human. Saying that you love God. It's so easy. I want everybody to do it on the count of three. Just say, I love God. One, two, three. Right? That was really easy to do. And if that was as simple and as easy as loving God was, then all of us would be able to do it perfectly. But the reality is, is I think that we do that often. We say that, we sing songs where we're praising him and we're worshiping him, but our hearts look so different. Our hearts don't match up with our our words. And Jesus uh, had a similar situation where he ran into some hypocritical people. In Matthew chapter 15, verse seven, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says, hypocrites, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, this people honors me with their lips. And this is so sad, but their hearts are far from me. I don't want that to be true of me. I don't want that to be true of us. And so if we say that we are believers, if we say that with our mouths, that we love God and we're offering our bodies and our minds as a sacrifice, then that has to be true of the inside. Romans 12, one and two says that if we do these things, these are, these are true worship. 
to offer our bodies as sacrifices is true worship. And so I want to ask you a question. We're going to do this for each of these points. I want to ask you questions that you either ponder yourself or you bring up in small group later. And the question is simply this, do your words match your worship? Write that down. Think about it. Maybe you don't bring it up in small group, but maybe you think about it on your own. Do my words match my worship? Do the things that I say about God, is it the same if if I live that out? I, I can hear that you love God, but can I see it? I can hear that you love God, but is it true? Is it not hypocritical? Is it genuine? Is it authentic? That's why that word is in our our mission statement here. We want to see you develop authentic relationships with Jesus. I'm not concerned, Tucker or Steph, none of your small group leaders, we are not concerned with the superficial. But we want to see it be authentic. We want to see fruit from that. And so is your love genuine? Number two, we love God by hating evil. Paul says, detest evil. Do you guys know what the word detest means? Because I didn't. I had to look it up. To detest something is, is not just to not like it, but it's to, to be so like, disgusted by it. There's a deep hate within you, right? And, and I think we get the word you know, dislike or I don't like this. We get that confused with hate in our culture today, right? I know a lot of things that people don't like. People don't like pineapple on pizza, People don't like, I I like pineapple on pizza, but I know a lot of people don't. People don't like waiting in the line at the grocery store. People don't like having a ton of homework. But I have never known anybody in my entire life, and maybe they're out there, but I have never known anybody in my entire life that hates and is literally disgusted to the point that they can't even be in the same room as pineapple on pizza. You see, not liking something and hating and being detested by it it is not the same thing. You see, I cannot like sin, but do I hate it? We cannot like sin and we can can be uncomfortable by it, but do we hate it? The character of God is is one that has nothing to do with evil. And we read this in Psalm chapter five, verse four. It says, for you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil cannot dwell with you. It doesn't say it can't be near you. It says it cannot dwell with you. There is no evil in the presence of God ever. And so I want to ask you this question, and this is the question that I want you to write down for this one is, do I think about my sin the same way that God does? Because I got to be honest with you, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm more okay with it than I ever should be. And so do we hate sin the way that God does? And if we don't, then what needs to change about our thinking? Do we hate sin And do we feel about sin the same way that God does? Number three, we love God by loving good. You see, to hate sin is a good thing, right? That is is something that we are instructed to to do, but when he says cling to what is good, it's a both and. You see, hating sin without loving God, who is good, all that does is lead you to an apathetic, moralistic life. You see, hating sin is a good thing, but if you don't love and cling to what is good, you're caught in the middle, where you want to live a good life, where you don't want to see people get hurt, you don't want to see bad things happen, but you don't really care about the things of God. And I was, I was talking to a couple of guys this morning as I was pouring over this and trying to think about this message, and there was this image that came to mind. Right, I want you to all just imagine this with me for a second. Imagine you're in the middle of the ocean, right? No raft, no nothing. Imagine you're in the middle of the ocean. Close your eyes if you have to. And, and think that you hate the water, right? You're, you're detesting the water. And so you're trying to get out of it and you, you can do the thing where you kind of lunge up for a quick second, but what happens? You go right back into it. And so you're hating the things of God and you're, or not the God, you're hating the things of evil and you're trying to get out of the water but you can't. And so then a helicopter comes, right? And you see this, I think of like the Coast Guard, this is the image that comes to mind, where they come and they they drop down and they're reaching out their hand to try and grab you, or they drop down a ladder and you don't take it. You don't want it. You don't want to be in the water, but you don't want to cling to what is good. And I think that that's where a lot of us have caught ourselves. And I think that that's where a lot of culture has gone wrong is we, we don't like to see bad things happen to people. We don't like to see sin take place. Nobody likes to see people get hurt and see people die and see people go through difficult situations, but 
there's a lack of clinging to God. And so are we hating the things of evil and loving the things of God? Do I hate evil as much as I love God and do I love God as much as I hate sin? You see, we can't just do either or we have to do both. Do I hate evil and love God? Number four, we love God by not being lazy. This, in the CSB, it says, do not lack diligence and zeal, but honestly, I like the way that the NLT puts it where it just says, never be lazy. Never be lazy. Do you know why, as believers, we are instructed to not be lazy? Do you know why that, that, that's a sin? You see, at the heart and the root of laziness is pride. And I think that that is where so many of us have caught ourselves and maybe you are in the middle of that season right now where you are lazy and it is pride that you just don't want to admit that it's pride. You know, there are so many of us, and again, I have been in this situation time and time again where I just don't want to do things that are good. I don't want to do the work that God has set out before me because I'm lazy, because I'm prideful. But I want you to think about this. In Philippians chapter two, one of, I think, the greatest descriptions of the character of Jesus, it talks about how Christ is not a prideful person, but in fact, he was, a, he was the most humble person to ever walk the face of the planet. See, at the very root of Jesus's character was humility. And so when we are lazy, when we're prideful, when we say what I want, my comfort, my apathy is more important to me than the things of God, what we are saying is that we are prideful. And when we do that, we go directly against the character of Jesus. You see, the call for every believer, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 says, discipline yourselves for the sake of godliness. You see, that's what we are working towards. That's what we're striving towards. That's why we're doing any of the things that we've listed off tonight is because we want to be like Jesus. And so if that's the call of every believer, if we're being lazy and we're being prideful, we're walking in two different directions. And we can't do it. And so we have to choose to not be lazy. We have to work hard. Ephesians chapter 10 says, for, you, for we are his workmanship. For you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. For what? For good works. Not to enjoy a comfortable life where you never have to put in any effort, but we are created for good works. And so I want to ask you this question, and this is probably for me one of the most convicting questions in this entire message. How does laziness keep me from pursuing holiness? Because at one point or another, it does. Whether it's not wanting to wake up on time to read your Bible, whether it's not wanting to get to bed early enough because you're too busy doing other things and so you don't have time to wake up. Hey, I'm, I'm too concerned with watching other things and so I don't have time to pray. Hey, I don't have time to give because I'm spending all of my money on things that, that are harmful, things that I'm addicted to. How is laziness keeping you from pursuing holiness? Ask yourself that question. Bring it up. Talk about it in your small groups later because I know at some point or another, if it has or it is, laziness keeps us from pursuing holiness and keeps us from becoming more and more like Jesus. And then the last one. We love God by being fervent in the Spirit. Be fervent in the Spirit. You see, in verse 11, Paul says two things in light of one thing. He says, don't be lazy, be fervent in the spirit as you serve God. And so the don't be lazy is like the negative instruction, right? Don't do this, do this and serve God. And so we can think, okay, I'm not supposed to be lazy. I'm supposed to work hard. But then Paul says, be fervent in the spirit. Yes, we as believers are created and we're instructed to do good works. But if we're only doing works and we're working ourselves to the bone and it becomes monotonous and boring and, and tiring, see, that's not the way that we are intended to serve God. We're not supposed to be lazy, but it's supposed to be balanced with an enthusiasm and an excitement for the things of God. It's, it's supposed to be both of those things. If you look at the, the way that this is defined, it's like we're supposed to be boiling over with the Spirit. We're supposed to be so overflowing with the Spirit that we are so excited about the things of God. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time that you got excited about something that God is doing in you or another person? When's the last time you got really excited about seeing the Holy Spirit move? 
You see, we're supposed to grow in our knowledge, right? We're supposed to to work hard and be diligent in those things, but we're also supposed to be excited and enthusiastic about it. And so when we are diligently working hard and we are excited about the things of God, that leads us to passionate worship. Like we talked about earlier, Romans 12, 1 and 2, it is our true worship when we submit the, the things of our mind, the things of our living to God. And when we do both of those things, it is passionate worship that is both driven by hard work and an excitement to to see the Holy Spirit move. It's all of those things. You see, all of these instructions, all of these these five things that we talked about tonight and the things that we're going to talk about over the next week, they are for the believer. Things that we as believers can do to show and communicate our love for God. But I want to go back to what I talked about at the beginning of this message. We cannot get it mixed up. As we do these things, we are sanctified. We become more like Jesus, but sanctification and becoming more like Jesus never gets in the way of salvation and being saved by him. And and I think, again, we have become so obsessed in our culture and maybe that you come from a home where your works are your worth, not the case with Jesus. You see, when we submit our lives to God, we get to work in response to his love. In 1 John chapter 4, Verse 10, it makes it clear when it says this, love consists in this. Not that we loved God, because we didn't. We were enemies of him. And it was in that time that he loved us and sent his son Jesus to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The number one way, the primary way that we communicate our love for God is by responding and accepting the truth of the gospel. You see, we We love God in response to the love that he has shown on us. We don't love God to initiate a love that we are longing for. He does that first and so we receive that. We believe it. And again, if you are in this space and you have never considered the claims of Jesus, if you have come into this space week after week and this is, this is not for you. You're thinking, this, is, this isn't me, right? I don't, I don't know about Jesus. I don't, I don't know about all the resurrection. I, I don't know how I feel about any of that. Let me invite you into a relationship with him. God desires to see people surrender their life to him and be obedient to him. You can continue if you want to walk out of this space and think, I'm just going to pretend, I'm going to work my way to Jesus, I'm going to do a quiet time every day, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to, you know, have time and, and fellowship here, but I'm never going to surrender my life to Jesus. You're going to be just as empty as when you came into this building. And so, again, if, if that's never something that you've, you've considered, if you think that there is a better way, there's not. And so there is an invitation tonight there's an invitation when you go to your small groups to surrender your lives to Jesus and worship God with all that is in us as a response to his love, as a response to the love that he has shown on us through his son, Jesus. Ephesians chapter two, verses eight and nine. These are some of my favorite verses. And they're some of my favorite verses because they go so against what I would like the gospel to be. In my head, I'm thinking everything is so easy in this world. We just got to work, right? I work enough and then people see my worth and then they appreciate me and they love me. But that's not the case with Jesus because for you are saved, how? By grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. If you're thinking there is no way that Jesus is going to accept me the way that I am, he will. There is no way that that Jesus is going to look at me and, and think that there is anything worthy. He already has. Because he already went to the cross. He already died for you so that you can receive the free gift of salvation. Not from works. You're never going to be able to work your way to Jesus. All you have to do is receive the truth and submit your life to him. I would hate as we talk about the rest of this series, as we give you ways to walk as a believer for you to be fooled into thinking that if you just follow all of the instructions that we give you for the next month, that some way, somehow you're gonna receive joy and happiness and you're gonna, you're gonna end up with Jesus in eternity. It's not the case. And so stop trying to work for it on your own. Surrender your life to him and begin to walk in the freedom. Paul says in, in chapter six of Romans, 
that you used to be a slave. And that led, you used to be a slave of sin and that led to death, but no longer. For you are now a slave to righteousness and that leads to life and life eternal. Some of you have made that decision and you're walking in it. I would encourage you to continue to grow in that, cultivate discipline so that you can continue to communicate your love for God through obedience.